Welcome back to Optimal Nutrition Simplified. This is the, whoa, whoa, whoa! That's what? already a gigantic thing you just said. Optimal Nutrition Simplified. Yeah, that could we could just spend the next month talking Dude, about I know. the simplicity and how we have messed it up. I I know. It's, how am I supposed to sell something? I, I don't know. Um, and and the problem is is like. Even though that's the title of the podcast, like we could talk about a, a, a bajillion things more because ultimately simplifying health is, I think, the, the bigger thing um, and, and nutrition just being a subset of that. So if the audience is not familiar with Kelly, Kelly, I would say single-handedly saved like tens of thousands of injuries from occurring across the many years that he's like maybe even hundreds of thousands. I'm I not joking. Hundreds of thousands. Maybe millions. Ma billions. We, we billions. have... Here... If you don't know, what we've done is said, this is what you should know. I bet you're smart enough to take care of it. Yeah, that's true. But it's uh, for you to have that consistency over many, many years Oof. and and to be able to like get that ingrained into people's minds is really, really big. So basically, Kelly kind of brought mobility to the CrossFit industry and it's spread since then. He uh, He's the founder of Mobility Wide. He's also the founder of, of uh, San Francisco CrossFit. Which I, would is where I would just correct you and say co-founder because co my CEO wife... I mean, I'm only like, my, my brain's like 20% and the action, as you know, is that CEO. Is that is true. The team is 80%. 100%. And then also, uh, he's also the, uh, I assume, solo, well, you, you obviously had help on the book too, but um, becoming- No, it's all in my brain. Yeah. All in your brain. So, becoming a supple leopard, New York Times bestseller. Thank you so much for hosting me and thanks for being on the show, Kelly. Oh, you know, I don't want to talk about nutrition. Okay. <laughs> I never, I never <laughs> wanted to talk about nutrition. I didn't want to be that guy. We don't have to do that. I have friends who are, but you have to talk about nutrition. You have to. You have to be an expert in this. You have to be a competent dabbler. You have to feel again. You have to be aware. If we're going to talk about the health of your tissues mm -hmm. or your durability or your anti-fragility, your ability to be resilient and actually respond to that stress, it starts with just a couple things. Like, are you moving? Do you sleep? Tell me what you're eating. Mm -hmm. And we see, I mean, we, my wife and I were just having a discussion yesterday in the car on the way home about we're starting to see this real problem between people in their 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. where sort of the biological de evolution, what is uh, Taleb calls it um, the tragedy of mod modernity, right? Yeah. Modernity. Yeah. And modernity. Modernity, thank you. <laughs> and I think what we're seeing is the human being is so tolerant. And can buffer mm -hmm. just such incredible stress, nutritional stress, nutritional uh, scarcity, yeah. um, wine, you know, poor sleep. Yeah. And all of a sudden you can't. And you're like, yeah. well, what's going on? Why did I get all puffy? Why did I put on 30 pounds and my skin looks like I'm 80? And, you know, maybe it's because we're both 45 or because we're seeing a lot of our friends at the same age cohort. Mm -hmm. They don't look good. Yeah, they're not. They don't feel good. They don't sleep good. And when we cut them in half, and when I say cut them in half and count the rings, I'm saying we look at their blood panels. Yeah, it's really bad, and it's very you know. And I, we're gonna have to get to the bottom of this. And I think what what we're saying is, look, you can go exercise, mm -hmm. your brain's out, but you, if you're not eating like a human, and there's a lot of ways into that. But if you're not eating like a human, and when I when I say that, as I'm like, do you eat food? Yes or yeah. no? And I think Michael Pollan started to put us in the right direction. I totally which is agree. which is the yeah. sole reason why we're here because yeah. of what you're trying to do because mm -hmm. I, I mean people need help we yeah. need crutches yeah but if you don't speak nutrition we can't talk about performance we can't talk about sleep we can't talk about any of it yeah so and I, I agree I think a yes it's true we do need crutches but at the same time I think what Michael Pollan said is maybe is, not crutches tools that's what I meant to say. sure that's fine um, I mean listen like I, Yes, I'm the CEO of a food company, and yes, we make food-like substances, or as Michael Pollan would say, edible food-like substances. And so those are very helpful, but also at the same time, let's have people have whole, healthy, real food as well. Yeah, and I, I think what always is lacking is the context piece of this. Um, mm -hmm. I remember that uh, there was a very well-known paleo blogger writer book. She's written a really popular book. She was training in our gym. Yeah. And I had two kids, was working two jobs. I mean, I was as thin as a human being can get stressed. Yeah. Yeah. We were, um, you know, in the nascent startup phase of this thing, you know, eight years ago, nine years ago. And uh, I had been at the gym for 12 hours. I had like flown in from the night before, got my kids off, coached, 
I'm just a disaster of a human being. I'm living off coffee and, and hope. Okay? <laughs> and um, yeah. I pull out a muscle milkshake. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, I can't believe you're going to eat that. And she literally muscle milk shamed me in front of my entire class. And first of all, it's my gym. So hold on to your butt. If you're gonna try to you're gonna try to big dick me or big gorilla me in front of my class, like you're wrong. And um, you know, her point is really well taken. Like that isn't a food. Yeah. Right? What like that thing is full of heavy metals. That thing is it's a food like yeah. substance that's not even quality. But I was just stoked that I remember put this thing in my bag. Yeah. So that at six o'clock I yeah. wouldn't be eating yeah, yeah. whatever I could scrounge. Yeah. You know, in an act of desperation. And I think it's that dissonance. Yeah. That we've got to tease apart for people. She, yeah. You know, she was like, "Like, why don't you meal prep?" I'm like, "Nice for you, single working, you know, single, not even mother. All you do is blog and take pictures of your food. Yeah, and you have all of this free yeah. time. But the average person really doesn't. Yeah. And so, when we're going to get into conversations about nutritional quality or movement or or lifestyle, we have to go talk about efficacy. We have to talk about barriers to adherence how do we simplify the system so that people can actually do the right thing yeah and it's not some heroic measure because i was like yeah. dude i can't get up at three in the morning to food prep what are you talking about <laughs> yeah you know? yeah no exactly i mean like the, the adherence component is is i think that's that's the struggle because ultimately we all can very quickly and easily figure out what we should do but actually if you know if you have two kids if you have two jobs if you're you know if you and and you you like just as much as anyone should have a, should be like oh i'm gonna eat perfect because my brand, you know, depends on it. It's, it's, and if, if even you are struggling, then we can imagine that, you know, normal, regular people whose, whose job is not health. That's right. Is, uh, it's, it's just as who, hard as probably. Who, who don't even have the, uh, the information. Exactly. The correct information. So yeah. suddenly you add, you add, hey, do you have the correct information on this? Right. And now do you have a entire ecosystem set up, yeah. you know, for people to be in your gym reminding you to eat, sure. publicly shaming you? Yeah. It doesn't happen. And so there are so many steps between making the right decision. And one of the things that I have found really useful is that when in physical therapy or let's say in the gym, yeah. if I'm trying to get a better outcome out of someone, a better movement, I'll often constrain their movement. Uh, sure. And that, that movement constraint or constraint patterning or – constraining behavior so you get the right outcome is really a useful tool. So for example, when people are jumping and landing in like a burpee yep. and their feet are collapsing turned out and we're seeing that they're getting up and off the ground, yes, but they're violating all these motor patterns that translate and it's not really effective movement. It's 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 a movement solution, but it's not the right thing. Yeah. So all I say is, all right, you just win getting your feet together. So now you have to burpee with your feet together. And what ends up happening is we automatically constrain their movement behavior sure. and we end up in a position where it's tenable. I take away their choices. Yeah. So if I put something in my backpack, mm -hmm. and this thing didn't exist a decade ago, yeah. right? No. If I put you know, this shake, this meal in my backpack, then when it, and I've blown my lunch and I haven't eaten vegetables, I automatically reach for the only thing because that's what's constrained. Yeah. And that's how we have to think about all those aspects of our lives. Yeah. You know, if if I set myself up to do the right thing, then I'll do the right thing. If I give myself choices or weight or hope that I'll have you know, uh, we are one of our models is to show us you can be consistent before you're heroic. Yeah. And, you know, man, Jocko Willick says, yeah. right, the same thing. He's like, look, you have to have discipline because you can't rely on inspiration. Yeah. So apply that to the granularity of your life. You know, yeah. if you're worried about brushing your teeth, you know, set your toothbrush on your pillow, yeah. you'll brush your teeth. Well, it's kind of like, um, and by the way, guys, in, in case uh, in case the background noise is picking up, uh, we are in a gym, and yes, there is. Uh, it's real world. <laughs> yeah, real world. So deal with it. But um, you know, I think you know, there's there's that that tendency to say, well, I'm just going to have more discipline. But ultimately, we 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 basically fall to the level of our training rather than rise to the level of our yeah. like, expectations. And and you could apply that thinking training to. Uh, habit yeah to learn behavior to cultural yeah. uh ingrained behaviors and so you know who, who your how, what, how your mom ate and what she ate for breakfast probably determines what you're gonna eat for breakfast right and the friends around you yeah. um you know which which brings us back to you know the, what are the building blocks that we have to be human and that that tribal community matters yeah. that that shared burden matters and um you know, probably we don't have a chance to cook breakfast for each other enough yeah something like that so so I, I kind of want to get back to that because, as, as I've said to you a couple of times, like you have some of the best thoughts on what it actually means to be human. And so, you know, what do you think, 
and this is a very big question here, but like, what are we missing? What what are we not doing that we that we should be doing uh, in terms of like missing out on, on that humanity piece? I think we can use the nutrition as sort of a, a template for understanding. Like we have gamified whole foods, right? And, and like, oh, you're eating rice. I'm like, yeah, that's not really the problem. You know, yeah. and, yeah. uh, you know, um, we, one of the tenets that we believe in for sort of the building blocks of, of yeah. our nutrition strategies that we're like, look, you need to eat as many vegetables and as many different colors as you can choke down and mm -hmm. as many different varieties, eat the rainbow, right? That's yeah. what we've been saying forever. Yeah, yeah. So if, if that is one of those cases we're saying, Hey, look, there's some things you should stay away from. There's a lot of junk, but there's some obvious things that you need to put back in. Mm -hmm. If we applied that sort of rubric to our movement yeah. selves and lives suddenly you'd see that wow we're really we're we're eating the equivalent of processed like a processed wheat bread sandwich with a chicken breast and maybe some iceberg lettuce that yeah. is our move like that yes sure. that's food and it yeah. has some macronutrient blocks in there but um it's not really gonna it's take not care of us. and no. it's not even gonna take care of us in the long haul there's yeah. we're missing big chunks of that so if I went into your life today and said, hey, I'm just going to look at the diversity of your movement. Okay, yeah. I see that you got up from the bed and you walked around, you sat at the couch and you went to your chair and then you sat at the kitchen table and then you got in your car. And, you know, like your movement window is tiny. Yeah. Your movement variety is tiny. You're, you know, and so what, what you're seeing is that we're really living this impoverished movement life. Yeah. And if you did things like um, just sat on the ground – during watching TV hmm. and fidgeted a ton, for example, that would force your hips into a whole bunch of ranges of motion that you did not touch during the yeah. day. So is it is it simply that, I mean, because here's my question. I, I, I sometimes get back to like, hey, are humans inherently fragile? And is that the reason yeah. why we have to do, uh, you know, this this mobility training? Because I, 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 can't, I can't imagine our ancestors having to, you know, warm up or, or do mobility movements before they ran from a tiger. So how are we different? Is it, is it because of that? Yeah, I like that. I, I think I think that's really the idea is, um, you know, if we look at sort of chronic pain in America today yeah. and try to tease that apart, what we have is highly inflamed, like twitchy, crappy tissues, yeah. right? And the, the technical term for that in, in our physio term is PPP, piss poor protoplasm, right? <laughs> and, and, and you'll see this. You'll see... Yeah. Um, We'll see veganism is a good example where you can certainly eat plant-based, but there are going to be some holes mm -hmm. in your tissue quality. Sure. Every plant carbo every plant-based pro uh, protein is handled by your body as a, like a carbohydrate, right? So it's really we tend to see a lot of big insulin spikes if you're not controlling that with fat. You're missing some proline. You're missing some kind of essentials that are building blocks for collagen. Sure. Right. And if you have genetics that predispose you for say that you don't really express good collagen making and you're older. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We start to see lots of sort of type one errors in, in how you're eating. If, when you say type one errors, can you use like a, a fundamental error? So my assumption is that I'm eating a certain way cause it's correct, but there's a, there's a flaw in my assumption sure. and that leads to errors down the chain that are actually resulting from my primary assertion. Yeah. Right. Do I think you need to eat a steak every meal? Absolutely not. Do you need to have, you know, but one of the things we're, we're learning about in this modern science self is, boy, you've got to, if you're getting older, your, your ability to use the protein, your protein signaling is diminished mm -hmm. and attenuated and blunt, just the way you're, you lose your deep sleep as you get older. Sure. That's a problem. Well, so is you need to eat more protein as you get older because what we're talking about is you're going to be a hundred years old and you're absolutely going to want to be strong and resilient when you're a hundred years old. So the question is. Are we fragile? If we're looking at back pain, we've got a lot of, you know, we're just talking about the fact that if your tissues are highly inflamed and, and that's short for sensitized, easily yeah. sensitized. Yeah. Um, here's an example and I'll come back. Sure. We had a friend who was cross country skiing and she just fell on her face, cross country skiing. Yeah. And she dislocated her shoulder terribly. Hmm. And if you, it wasn't a traumatic fall. She was kind of skating. So she was close to the ground going uphill and she yeah. just slipped. Her body, she thought she was super fit. Yeah. I'm eating super clean. I have this sashimi chicken breast and this broccoli. I'm clean. Yeah. Right? I don't have any connective tissue. I'm not eating good honey fats. I'm not exposing myself to offal and organ meats and mm -hmm. right, just trying to eat the rainbow. Yep. I'm eating what I think and perceive is to be yep. so I'm going to soul cycle. Yeah. Right? I I uh, you know, I'm going to you know, I, I don't understand. I'm so fit. 
<laughs> yeah. And what we have is a system that really is metastable. And that metastability means it's a system that appears stable, but it doesn't take much of a triggering effect mm. to sensitize it, to destabilize it. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening with us. I think uh, my core belief is that the resting state of the human being is pain-free. Sure. And <clears throat> most children are pain-free. But when we start to layer in the complexity of our eating habits, yeah. our movement poverty, um, we don't, we're sedentary, we're stressed, we don't sleep. Start to add those things, and what we start to see is, boy, the, the body is looking for input sometimes, and that input is expressed itself as pain. Hmm. So, <clears throat> do I think that human beings have been putting input into other human beings, making them feel better for a long time? As long as there have been humans. We have been massaging each other, sure. and non-sexual touch is one of the things that humans do. Yeah. If you don't believe me, go watch a couple apes interact and, and groom right. themselves and oh, yeah. throw, right? Like, this is the humans. This is what totally. we do. And... Um, I think that input is lost, and then all of a sudden, the body's looking for these other inputs. So a good analogy for this is your shoes. Yeah. Right? Uh, a couple years ago, some physical therapy uh, researchers found out that strong feet are higher volume than low than weak feet. Higher volume? Yeah. Okay. Turns out muscles take up more space than no muscles. Than, yeah, than air. <laughs> <laughs> than weak yeah. muscles, right? Yes. And, and everyone's like, whoa, this is incredible. And you're like, really? Is it really? <laughs> is it really? Yeah. And... Um, you know, if you're walking around not challenging your feet, so this is yeah. a great example. Physical therapy. Yeah. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a card carrying member, but there's some physical therapy stuff that drives me crazy because it just re it fails to reflect in what it is we do as humans. So sure. you have weak feet, so they give you these foot exercises, right? Mm -hmm. Pick these things up with your toes. Yeah. The foot is a weight bearing structure. Yeah. It is not a dexterity device. Yeah. So if you want to load it and make it strong, you need to do what? Load it. Yeah. And it comes back to sort of this fundamental idea, and I think it's lost in all this, and we can use an example of um, the orca whale here locally, right? We okay. had, we had Tillicum used to be a local whale. And when you, put a, when you put a killer whale into captivity, over time that fin folds, hmm. right? It's called folded fin syndrome, okay. floppy fin syndrome. I think folded is a little nicer. Sure. But um, what's happened is two things. One is that you've altered the orca's behavior, so it spends mm -hmm. a lot more time with the surface. And because it spends a lot more time with the surface, that fin is exposed to higher gravitational loads. So that moment arm on the fin is higher because yeah. it's at the surface all the time. Sure. Secondarily, because that fin isn't exposed to all the swimming, swimming, hunting, play forces, this orc is not swimming at those high speeds. Yeah. The tissues become weak. Yeah. Collagen at the base of the fin. So you change the behavior, you de-evolve it, yeah. right? You, you, you make it weak and all of a sudden you start to see the, the folded fin. That's your foot yeah. in every pair of shoes that you wear. In every pair of cushion shoes that you wear, yeah. you can't sense what's going on around you. You can't feel the ground. You're not getting the motor sensory input. If you look at the homunculus of the brain, which is that sensory motor map of how your brain is mapped onto what your body feels, yeah. your face, mouth, huge amounts, hands, totally. huge amounts, feet, huge amounts. Also huge, yeah. Elbow, not so much. <laughs> so, what is it about humans? Well, we, you know, clearly shoes are rad, yeah. but they're not letting our feet be our feet. So, you now, if you're supposed to take 10,000 steps a day, that's yeah. our RDA for movement. Sure. That's so that's the minimum so you don't get rickets, so you don't get scurvy. Yeah. yeah. If you don't take those 10,000 steps or if you do and you're taking 3,000 steps and and if you don't believe me, pick up your phone, which you have with you all the time, go into your daily activity and mm -hmm. your phone is counting your steps for you in the background. Fantastic. So you can see this. So we don't on like activity tracker, I've got one, it's called your phone. You have always have it with you. And um, so you want to want to want to surprise your kids? Hey, you know your kid in high school. Hey, let me see how much you move today. Like I guarantee <laughs> you, she always had her phone with her all day long. Oh yeah. And what you'll see is you're not moving at the base amount. Mm -hmm. So the concept is mechanotransduction, which means that at a cellular level, I have to have mechanical input for the cell to express itself sure. at a normal level. So great, I ate all that collagen. I'm adding all this collagen back into my stuff and I'm eating yeah. the offal. But if I don't load the Achilles, if I don't load the tendon, I don't load the cartilage, the, the tissue will not respond. Mm -hmm. Because the human being is an anti-fragile machine. Sure. Which means that when you load it, it reacts in a way that makes it more robust. In fact, yeah. some of the new research that's just come out of Davis around um, collagen synthesis is that the genes that are activated after you exercise, mm -hmm. The first genes are collagen synthesis genes. Really? So it's like the body says, oh, well, I know what we're going to do here. We need to get you more robust yeah. and adapt. Let's build up the structure first before we put in 
the the system sure that make makes sure. it. Yes, yeah, make sure it works. I still see green light there. Any there chance? it is. Uh, we're good. Right. So how do we then, right? If that's the case, and I don't have so there's twofold. I've got to eat right, and I've got to move. Yeah. And if we did that, if we just maintained our range of motion as kids, played on the ground, fell. We were just at Woodward this weekend up mm -hmm. in Tahoe. And I was watching uh, actual two-year-olds, three-year-olds on trampolines playing around. I watched one boy in the matter of five minutes fell like 72 times. <laughs> maybe that's hyperbole. Maybe it was 82 times. Maybe it was 50 <laughs> times. But if I fell to the times. ground 50 times, yeah. I would be destroyed. <laughs> and I'd be like, good workout. Let's go home. <laughs> exactly. That's just play within yeah. the, when the course of 20 minutes yeah. of self-exploration. So. That's the level of loading creativity, and we're just basically we bubble wrapped ourselves. We get yep. into our cars, we wear these cute shoes, we eat terribly, we don't sleep, mm -hmm. we're stressed, and then we're like, "Wow, my body feels terrible." And yeah, this disc suddenly is not really working yeah. like a disc anymore. Like, well, what did you think was going to happen? Yeah, it is really interesting because you know I think like there's the expectation that's like, well, I should be healthy, um, but we kind of forget about how we actually evolved, and it's like, well, kind of. It, it, it almost seems when you think about it within that context, like it's a no brainer why we would be so unhealthy. In fact, part of me says, how are we not more unhealthy? I think, I, I, yeah, I really, I think that's the thinking that's correct. So when I work with the military, I work with all the branches of the military and they're trying to really un unravel this Gordian knot of, yeah. of musculoskeletal injury. So I'm just like, look, forget, forget all the other parts. Yeah. I'm just going to help you with this one piece. A few years ago, the Army had a study that they had about a million non-combat related orthopedic injuries in the hmm. Army every year, wow. which was 55 million lost user days. So we're not talking about IEDs or battle related or train related, just, hey, my back hurts, my knee hurts, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we have to ask ourselves if, you know, um, recently I heard this great podcast that said, hey, look, if you don't believe in global warming or climate change, mm -hmm. that's fine. The Navy does. Yeah. Like. Do you think that's weird that they're spending all this money about their bases and they're really worried about it because they realize that all of their landscapes are going to be underwater? <laughs> so if the Navy cares about global climate change, what I'm telling you is that we're not the only people shouting that, yeah. hey, look, we're going for the rocks. Yeah. What we uh, A RAND study just came out that said 80% of Americans couldn't be deployed hmm. in, a, in a wartime situation because we're, we wouldn't meet yeah. the, the physical requirements. And we're not the first people to, to look at this. There's an old book um, – by, I forget the name of the, the writer, but it's called A Soldier's Load, The Mobility of Nation, written right after World War II, hmm. about, hey, our soldiers are carrying two large packs in World War II, yeah. and they're not fit enough. Huh. That sounds very familiar to say, yeah. right? Oh, same, yeah. some sort of same level issues. And even um, Napoleon's uh, like field marshal, his head field marshal, was Maurice de Saxe, who said, soldiering's in the leg. So... I think for a long time, as we said, people have been on to the fact that we're going to need a population that is healthy and robust. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever did, if you're listening, and you ever did the presidential physical fitness test? Oh, yeah, definitely. That was put in by JFK to make a generation of kids ready to be deployed. Hmm. That was what that was about. That was a secret subversive yeah, army yeah. healthy piece. And I think one of the ways that we're going to have to care about this is that we are setting people up for a lifetime of dysfunction that we're gonna pay for. Yeah. So you can be callous, you can say it's about my family, or you can be callous and say it's about my community, or you can be yeah. callous and say it's about our government and, and how much money we're gonna spend on this. But yeah. when we went to school, and this comes back to this, is when yeah. we went to school, chances of us being diabetic, yeah. one in 4,000. Hmm. And the new research is that the chances of our children being diabetic are one in four. That's independent of how much you're, yeah. you make or or what school you went to totally. or what color your skin is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And if you're if you're actually a black woman, your chances of being diabetic are two out of three as an adult. Hmm. A Latino male, two out of three. So something is going wrong. So your your original statement is, hey, I can't believe we're more messed up. Yeah. It's a testament to how robust we are and how quickly we can self-correct. Yeah. You start to put the right, you know that that um, that documentary, the magic pill. Yep. Where. We just said, okay, here's an extreme way of of eating temporarily sure. as a as a powerful intervention. Well, the interesting thing is that it, it seems extreme. It's not, you know, like to to a to a Western standard American diet. But it's actually not <laughs> right, really, right. really not just, at all. I mean, I think Mark Sisson a long time ago was yeah. like, yeah, just do me a favor, eat all the salad and all the vegetables you can in a day. Let me know if you yeah. get 100 grams of carbohydrate or not. <laughs> and it turns out. Yeah. You can't. Like you're going to be struggling to hit 100 yeah. grams of carbohydrate. Yeah. If you're eating intentionally, you should be yeah. like, I'm so tired of chewing. 
Yeah. And that's lo- actually how you should be feeling <laughs> yeah. at the end of the meal. I don't want to chew anymore. Don't make yeah, me yeah. chew that salad. <laughs> and um, I think when we come back to this basis, are human beings anti-fragile? Yes. Our bodies are designed to handle these stress loads and yeah. adapt positively. Yeah. So when we don't have a good adaptation response, something's going on. Yeah. And that means that we just have to be like, well, what is it we're getting wrong? Yeah. You know? And we demonize bread, for example, right? Sure. Well, it turns out bread has four ingredients, not 27 ingredients. And yeah. bread is a fermented food mm-hmm. and it's steam cooked. And if you make your own bread with wheat that's not treated with Monsanto and yeah. and you long ferment it. Sure. I just made a loaf last night, I make another loaf today. Hmm. And um, you know, I've got I'll even show you a picture. Yeah. That bread gives no one who's celiac or gluten insensitive in my family or anyone we know any gut problems. Because it's a highly fermented food, it's steam baked, and it has four ingredients. I don't know, man. Uh, the paleo gods might be uh, frowning upon you right now. I think they're going to be high five. Right? <laughs> oh, you're there eating fermented food. Just there we go. To. That's part of the maxim. But you know, yeah. the, the issue is that we've gotten really far away from. I mean, you know, how much homemade bread are you eating? Not a lot. Probably not. Yeah. You know, and if you're making it, yeah. So, you know, where do, I think the real question is, where do we begin to have this yeah. interventional? conversation and maybe for our 40 and 50 and 60 year olds i'm like it's too late for you <laughs> you know it's never too late human beings can react you don't ever stop healing yeah. but we're going to have to start changing these behaviors yeah really. so i have two questions and i want to start with actually the, the the adults and then i want to get to the to the kids how would we raise our kids differently but starting with the adults you know you had brought up a point that is it's very contextual like we say all these things but at the same time you know just as you said we have a couple of jobs we have you, you know kids we have other social engagements that we have. So if you were to simplify and to say, let's just say for uh, for the sake of movement, how can someone do this in, in a time when they don't actually have a lot of time to invest yeah. in it? Well, let's let's put first things first. Let's let's see if we can control what we think are the big pieces here. Yep. And one of them is the non exercise activity. Mm-hmm. So if you we, we started a walking school bus for our family, which meant that in the morning we meet at the corner, kids people would drop off their kids and lo and behold, we have a whole bunch of kids who walk the mile to school. And at the end of our first year of that, uh, I, cool. I walked to 5K today already. Yeah. And uh, just getting my kid to school, all before 8 o'clock. And uh, we meet at 7.50. You know, it doesn't take that long. It's yeah. about a 20-minute all-around walk. You know, maybe it's two and a half miles, whatever. And um, the we had a parent come to us and say, wow, I lost 30 pounds. And I was – and my, my own thing, I'm like – I want to lose 30 pounds. How did you get so <laughs> jacked walking to school? Yeah, it's yeah. to your point that human beings are craving input. Mm-hmm. We're looking for this input. The body is look is literally seeking these inputs, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like a thirsty plant. Yeah. And the first thing that I would say is, hey, let's see if we can get you to walk more during the day. Just move more. Yeah. Totally cumulative. If you get to home, you've only walked 8,000 steps, after dinner, go for a walk. Yeah. Let's hit your 10,000 steps. And one of the reasons we have to start there then we can talk about Pilates or we can talk about yoga or CrossFit or power or, or, sure. or soul cycle is now we have a body that's decongested, mm-hmm. a body that's accumulated enough fatigue to sleep and feel tired, a body that, um, you know, has loaded the tissues and prepared for more robust things. It's like, Hey, you're, you're keeping the engine idling instead of turning it off, redlining it, turning it off again. And that's really what we're doing. Definitely. So, Start there. And 10,000 steps isn't the goal. It's like 12 to 15,000 steps. Sure. It's actually, if you look back at the ancestral data, we estimate that we actually walk about 10 miles a day. So six to 10 miles a day. Yeah. Just walking. Definitely. And you can get a lot of that movement just by not sitting. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things we say is, hey, let's get rid of the junk. Yeah. So if you have a choice, like we're we're sort of perching right now. We're, yep. we're, at, a, we're at a bar height. Yep. And I have the option to do a lot of fidgeting while sure. we're talking. And this whole time we've been talking, I'm actually leaning, which means that I can begin to look at my behavior this way. Hmm. What we're trying to do is say, hey, look, the, one of the big stressors on the body is the sedentary behavior physiology load, yeah. which is the equivalent of just eating junk food. Like you can eat Twinkies and still kick ass. Twinkies and McDonald's, I guarantee you, you'll kick ass for a while. And then and then I'll see you, either in, when you're, you're out of toilet paper from the diarrhea or <laughs> your knee hurts. Yeah, yeah. But... I mean, let's let's get back to the, to the basics. And one of the basics things is if we can get rid of some of that um, optional st- sitting. Yeah. So, can I not sit on the bus? Can I 
answer my emails in a, in a standing position? Yeah. Can I work at a counter height, right? Sure. Our friends at Veridesk make this really cheap desk. It's, a, it's called like the three, Veridesk 360. Hmm. And it's just a big platform table that has legs, and yep. it turns any surface into a standing desk. That's pretty awesome. For cheap. Yeah. And it looks good. And I take it on my counter and I take it off my counter. Yeah. And I love it so much that it actually works for me. It's my desk when I sit on the floor. So <laughs> I'll sit and kneel and answer emails. It's a cool idea. And the idea here is if I just get rid of some of that junk sitting, yeah. then I have already put a lot of positive into the body. So it's going to be less effort for me to make these other radical changes. Yeah. And when we define sedentary lifestyle, what we have to say is, okay, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a, a physiologic marker, which means that if I fall below one and a half metabolic equivalents, which is if you've ever been on an old tre tread ma uh, treadmill or yeah. master has like Mets, yep. like you're actually like, what's a Met? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's basically a generalized unit of metric of how much an, an average body uses energy from just its daily background sure. goals, right? Yeah, yeah. So below one and a half is sedentary. That's yep. sitting. Above one and a half and your body's working. Got it. And you can... So, so it's effectively like a basal metabolic rate. Yes, yes. Okay, got it. So when you're above one, then you're spending more. Yeah. But one and a half is the trick. And so we can suddenly look at all the behaviors and say, well, am I above one and a half? Well, it turns out leaning and perching is automatically above one and a half. There we go. Because you're using your muscles to hold yourself upright. Yeah. That you're fidgeting. And, you know, and, and if you go into the deep physiology of this, you'll see that things like um, your blood sugar spikes when you sit down. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, you turn your muscles off and your big quads aren't being like, I don't need this sugar. Let's kick it out. There we go. So when we begin to put first principles first and let them run, yeah. then we start to untangle everything on the body. We look at it as a sort of – it's all stimulation, mm -hmm. stimulus. So the question is, is it a really expensive stimulus or is it a you – know, all stimulus is cost, right? This, getting in the heat and the sauna is still a stressor. Yeah. Ice is still a stressor. Eating is a stressor, right? It costs oh, me energy to eat and digest. Yeah. So, but some of them are CNS loving and some of them are CNS depleting. Sure. And it turns out that moving is one of the things that's a natural positive for us. Yeah. So when we start to untangle the complexity, as we and I were talking about at Jason's event, you know, there's no more complex structure in the known universe than the brain. That's it. That's the most complex structure in the known universe. And it's attached to the most complex physiology structure in the universe. So your mind, brain, and body together are the most sophisticated thing in the known universe. And what we're like, oh, yeah. And we're like, take this vitamin, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. do this high intensity. Even the New York Times today yeah. had an article like, oh, high intensity exercise, don't have time to exercise. Four minutes of this, two minutes yeah. of this, 11 minutes, you're set. I'm like, really? Is that what we're really telling people, New York Times? Because that is intellectual dishonesty. Hmm. Just eat salad, this meal, you'll be fine. Is that true? No. Let me see in 10 years. Sure. So the consistency on that thing yeah. is the is the magic bullet. Yeah, and you and you should so, you should still party. You should eat cookies. You should drink wine. You should just recognize that those things are stressors. Yeah. When should I do that? When I'm totally rested and loved and yeah. and feel good, yeah. and the rest of the time I really got to play like I'm going to be a hundred years old because I guarantee you're going to be a hundred years old. Welcome to the new club. So. Okay, so so basically, what you're saying is you kind of need to build this solid foundation of like, okay, either we're standing or we're we're, we're at least moving enough, and so that'll effectively give us enough input so that when we do kind of actually exercise, let's say it's CrossFit or let's say it's you know powerlifting or yoga or whatever, it'll actually you know we'll, we'll be in a position where we can actually build from that foundation rather than to kind of just you know because because it, it also seems like there's probably a lot of people who start one of these intense training programs but they're completely sedentary. The rest of the time or the rest of the day, and they don't actually have the uh, the either the muscle memory or this or the you know CNS hasn't been developed or, or even the tissues to tolerate. Yeah, right? exactly. That makes sense. You know, the, I think the most dangerous thing you can do in America is like a team in training. Mm -hmm. You know, cancer run because yeah. so many of the pieces are right. Here's a tribe. Here's yeah. a community. Here's drive. Here's motivation. Yeah. By the way, we're going from zero to a marathon. Yeah, and then the fallout numbers on those things, and the injuries, the soft injuries are through the roof because yeah. it's not that fault. You should be able to run a half marathon today, or at least yeah. walk a half marathon. Are you just Colt. guilting me? I'm just saying. You just guilting me? I'm well, saying, it's I funny. Know, so I know you're doing that with Jason. right? No, I know. Yeah, Jason Filippo was like, "Oh, you want to do a half marathon?" I'm like, begrudgingly said yes. So oh, I, I begrudgingly said no way. Are you? <laughs> I've run a marathon. I'm good. Begrudgingly, or I, I would be happy to say no. <laughs> anyway. Hey, I really think that this is important. Comma. 
I'm going to spend my credits elsewhere. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, I think what's amazing is you know there's that old Socrates you know ism about like may you never grow old without knowing the power and beauty of your body something like yeah. that right yeah. And I I think people don't realize how robust we are and how yeah. capable we are and what our background base fitness should be and could be yeah. with very little effort. You know I think I think that's a really good point because ultimately I think we have. We, we get stuck in our own minds about, hey, I'm weak, I'm unhealthy, no, especially no, with, no. If, if, if people already have either a chronic disease or an, or an injury or whatever, and we get stuck into, this, into this, this mindset of, I'm a fragile human being. And I think that's probably where, where it kind of needs to start, is to realize, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, they simply have never had the experience of being healthy, and they don't actually know how, how potentially easy it actually and, and relatively simple it could be to become healthy yeah and i think what's interesting is we have and, and it's certainly become complicated with instagram and yeah and the way we fetishize professional sports yeah but what we like to do is divide sport training into a few buckets and one of the first buckets is gpp general physical preparedness yeah that's the fitness your kids should be developing yeah. right now they can play and jump and run around and cut and play tag and and swing on the monkey bars. That's yeah. just that's what I should do. By the way, that's yoga, right? That's a movement practice. That's yep. that's Pilates. You know, that's that's maybe doing some hill repeats and carrying some something heavy. Yeah. Right. That's making sure. Then we and that that's fitnessing. That's that's wellness and health. And I think that's where, for example, CrossFit fits really well. Sure. Right. Is I think Greg was like, okay, we got an hour. We can get people to commit to three or four hours a week. Sure. And in that, we can have a diversity of movement practice mm -hmm. that's coordination-based, add some strength, put some conditioning in there, and have a really capable human being. And then, of course, we're like, let's go to the games. Let's see how far yeah, we can yeah, push yeah. this. But that GPP idea, that's a really sustainable model. I've been yeah. crossing now for 15 years, maybe 16 years. I'm still like, wow, I suck at that. I can get better at this. Yeah. I, you know. Okay, then we move into this different idea, which I call sports preparation, which means I stop high-fiving myself for getting off the couch, GPP, and I start saying, hey, why do I want to jump and lay off my feet straight? Why is it, do I care that my shoulder has full range of motion? So we can mm -hmm. say, okay, you're moving here. You don't need to be perfect here in this GPP phase, Yeah. but we blend that GPP sports preparation concept, and it yeah. messes us up hmm. because we're like, oh, GPP is enough. You're, like, you're moving. Come high-five, right? Yeah. You did it. Let's just do it. Like wrong. If you're going to apply that GPP to something else, then yeah. we need to have a little more sophisticated conversation sure. about pattern because that's where we're seeing all the injuries. Yeah. So our kids now aren't coming out of GPP, aren't getting sports preparation training. Yeah. And we're seeing girls tearing their ACLs six to eight times more yeah. than men. That mm. kids ACL rates are up 400% under 14. <laughs> like the number of musculoskeletal injuries of children, yeah. spinal injuries are shocking. Okay, so that's sports preparation. Then we have sports specific training. Yeah. And sports specific training means I'm engaged in a high level sport. What things do I need to do to support that sport? Because the goal is to win that sport, not GPP. Of course. Not even sports preparation. So I come out of that high intense training, sports specific yeah. training, which doesn't mean I try to mimic throwing a baseball. It means what are the things I need to do to be good at baseball? Yeah. Then I come back to sports preparation or I dip back in GPP. So when you start to look at the spectrum, yeah. what people are doing is jumping right in and being like, oh, I need this sports preparation or this sports specific training. Yeah. What they need is GPP. You yeah. need to put a heavy backpack on and go carry a hill. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. right? It's do all about this foundation. Do sun salutation yeah, yeah. and and do some push-ups. Like, like swing a kettlebell. And I think the revolution is happening. We're seeing GPP get into people's homes now. That's yeah. where we're going to see the – and those are where we're going to get the health markers back up. Yep. And – the analogy, and if we come back to our nutrition, is what we talked about in the yep. beginning, is saying, hey, look, now you're eating vegetables and mm -hmm. lean proteins and you're getting enough of the macronutrients you need. Now let's start twisting and turning in the, yeah. the levers a little bit. Hey, hey, let's play with your fat adaptation. Let's, right? Yep. Now, but what we do is go right to sports-specific nutrition. Yeah. What we need is GPP training. Yeah, it's like, you know, we, we, we want a supplement to just fix all of our problems, but it's like the, the, the foundation just needs to be there. So if you, example, like if we look at MoveNet, yeah. which is Erwan LaCour, and he has a brand new book out and it's gorgeous, that is a recipe for GPP yeah. moving through the environment with competence. It's yeah. not, I'm going to, I think the you would be confused if you looked at that and you're like, oh, that's not, that's not sports preparation. You're like, that's right. It's not sports preparation. It's what you should do. Yeah. If you look at Ido Portal, mm -hmm. on the other side, you have sports specific training. Yeah. What do I mean by that? 
to do his program takes four to six hours or two to four hours of training and it's very specific and develops a lot of capacities in the gym or for a very specific outcome. Yeah. So if you're throwing the evil eye on him, don't because that's not GPP. In fact, when people who do that programming, their conditioning goes to hell. Yeah. Right? They, bec they become less, maybe highly more coordinated than his doing. But that, understand what that is. Excellence, brilliant thinking, brilliant programming. Yeah. That's no different than playing a professional sport. Yeah. So what we have is on the, the sides of this is where do I fall Yeah. and and it's okay for me to dip in and out. So yeah. I have a big race coming up. My training looks to support that race. I come out of that race. Now I'm in this general physical preparedness that's a little bit more specific around technicality. And then I come back into fitness. So if you're going to a high intensity boot camp, great. That's great. But we're going to eventually need to have the next conversation. Sure. So as you had said before this meeting, I think we could probably talk for hours about yeah. this stuff, and I really actually would love to. So, uh, But I know you have a, a class to coach. This is the at, coach's lab. Yeah, the, there it's going to happen in a few exactly. months. We've got a couple more minutes. The, uh, you know, One of the things that um, we see is that I think people try to take it on by themselves yeah. in all things. Mm. And you know, coaches need coaches. We This is a practice. The most important, I think, um, sort of – a inflection point when, was I, when I read this book called Finite and Infinite Games. Sure. Right? Yeah. And I think we look at nutrition, we look at health as a finite game. It has a start yeah. and a finish, has clear rules, and it's so easy, and we can, winners and losers. And if you play it that way, mm -hmm. I failed today, I lost the game. Yeah. You're never going to be happy and it's never going to win. This is an infinite game. And yeah. the only way you can play an infinite game, because you don't really know the rules, because yeah. you don't know what's going to happen to you, what stress is going to happen, what, you know, the only way to win is to play beautifully and to keep everyone else in play. Yeah. So that means that you got to play for your family. And that means you got to play for your friends. And that the only way to really unravel this Gordian knot of human capacity and function and really enjoy the bounty of having a spine that is not a fragile piece of shit, right? <laughs> Every time dogs are like, the knee's a bad design, I'm like, is it? Have you seen what humans done? We went to Mars. We're going to Mars. Like, I don't think knee's a bad design. <laughs> so, you know, the, the idea here is, you know, we are so incredible. Let's continue to play. And if you didn't play well today, play play as well as you can today, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll play better tomorrow. Yeah. And that really ends up creating this this notion that I'll never have it solved because my physiology will change, yeah. and my demands will change. My like, yeah. have a kid fly on a red eye. Let me know how you go. Like, <laughs> tell me not just stuffing donuts down your throat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and the other thing as well is like you said, you know, we're not we we can we can make ourselves good for both ourselves as well as our community but also you know even if you even though a lot of these concepts are simple it's okay to ask for help it's okay to you know you have a, a community as well that supports you too yeah and mm -hmm. I, I think that's <clears throat> i think what we did was we had this old patriarchy model yeah right let me go see the expert in the ivory tower yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly we're like whoa so once everything's mucked up i go see that expert yeah right what we're realizing is that we can decentralize that democratize this info sure and i i think we're in that phase right now it's really confusing yeah but it's you know there were what three keto magazines at my little store and i was like well that's confusing totally you know we're demonizing you know food totally or we're saying that there is a optimal way and what we know is that that's not true yeah you know people are like what do you think of this training program I'm like does it work is it working for you are you making exactly. progress are you winning it's so individual and the thing is is like we're especially on the on the nutrition side of things like we know a lot of great principles. I mean, just eat real food and um, you know, not too much. Mostly plants. That's the whole like Mike, Michael Pollan thing. The other thing though is like we're also just beginning to you know study all this stuff. So ultimately, like until we've figured it all out, which is probably going to take a couple hundred years, if not forever, you have to kind of like you have to listen to your own body. And I think that that the yeah, the, and and not and that's not a platitude. Really pay sure. attention. I ate that. How do I feel? Yeah. How to perform? So, for example, one of the things you have here is you have three different meals here. Yeah. Right. I'm going to call them shakes. Sure. Right. I have a standard 400 calorie meal, which is yeah. about a good snack for me. Right. Yeah. Over here is I I have one that doesn't have doesn't have many carbohydrates in it. Yeah. If I'm not moving, mm. I don't eat carbohydrate. So if I'm traveling. Yeah. I look like I'm a keto fiend because I'm like, I don't need carbohydrate today. Yeah. So I go super low. Yeah. You know, 20 to 30 grams, which is not even super low. That's just like moderately low. Yeah, so yeah. this is my choice. Yeah. I have a lot of athletes because we know from genetic testing mm -hmm. and food sensitivity, they don't handle milk proteins yeah. at all. 
Yeah. Right. Your genetics tell you that. Guess what? They get plant-based foods because if I give them whey, they shit themselves. They get <laughs> diarrhea, which is yeah. not a winning strategy and yeah. really mess with their gut. And so what we can do is say, hey, look, first and foremost, it's about foods. How does the food make you feel? Mm -hmm. Then we can start to layer in the complexity and then you just put things out, pull it back in. But for example, the, you know, you can be flexible and dynamic across all these. I fit into all of these. Yeah. And it's, and it's the contextual, it's contextualized in your, both your daily life as well as like, you know, each individual use case or even, you know, when you're, when you're recommending this to other people. So, I mean, I, I love the flexibility of that. And I think the kind of commitment to a first principles approach and to kind of really understand, you know, kind of the basics, the fundamentals and build from there is, is probably the, 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 for me, the biggest takeaway of, of, of this conversation conversation yeah and uh and it's okay it's okay to play and to dabble and if you look, stand on the scale and you get a blood test and your performance sucks you're like man it's not working so well yeah right and then we can make we can make the changes and you and the body is so sensitive that it will react quickly yeah but also it can change course again yeah and yeah. we should be building that flexibility back mm -hmm. in you know so um you know it, it's very confusing i wish i didn't have to talk to my athletes about nutrition but man I seem to spend a lot of time talking about it. Well, I mean, it is important and, uh, you know, it's, it's just as foundational as movement yeah. uh, to our it lives. Is. And so, you know, that plus I think some of the, the mental stuff as well, mental community sleep. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, they're all important. And, uh, modern, modern society teaches us to not really have as much intuition around that. So I think it, it's, it's important and it's good that you're actually spending time talking about it. Thanks so much, Kelly. Such a pleasure. Definitely. Thanks, Talk to you good. next time. This podcast was brought to you by Ample. Ample is the company that I founded a few years ago when I realized how difficult it could be to stick to a healthy whole foods diet that we talk about on the podcast within the confines of a busy life. See, when time was short, I often found myself and others turning to convenience foods, but I found that they either had poor ingredients, too much sugar, or they just didn't fill me up. So that's when I started Ample. Ample is a nutritious, complete meal replacement drink made from quality, real food ingredients that makes it super simple to eat healthy on the go. We've made Ample with a blend of premium proteins, healthy fats, fiber, organic greens, and probiotics. It's low in carbs and sugar, and is designed to keep you full and energized for several hours. Our original ketogenic and plant-based formulas make an awesome breakfast, lunch at the office, post-workout meal, or quick meal on the go. And they're available in 400 or 600 calorie meal sizes. Ample provides the quality nutrition you need without you having to skip a beat. Check it out at amplemeal.com.